Today's show is sponsored by our friends at orcacoolers.com. And if you want some of the best roto molded coolers, you got to go with Orca. These things are bear proof. They keep the ice cold for like five days. I've done it. I've gone camping. I put the ice in there. Five days later, it was still good as new. Plus, they have some of the best tumblers you could ever find. They have a Georgia Bulldogs championship tumbler that I just got Zeke for his birthday. Go to orcacoolers.com. Use code DADSEASON because it is dad season year round. You will get 20% off your order. That is code DADSEASON for 20% off your order at orcacoolers.com. Today's show is also sponsored by our friends at Action247.com. And if you want action, get in on the action with our friends at Action247.com, Tennessee's only sports book by Tennesseans for Tennesseans. The Titans didn't make it in the playoffs, but there will be things. We will announce it later on this week for conference championship promos. And you can also follow them at TN Action 247, Tennessee Action 247 on all the social media platforms, and they will have promos of what they're going to have later on this week the stuff for the nba the stuff for college basketball the stuff for the australian open and of course the conference championships that will be coming up this weekend in the nfl so go ahead and use code dads 100 they will match your deposit up to 800 dollars up until the super bowl that's 800 bucks by using code dads 100 at action 247.com <laughs> Hello, hello, everyone. My name is John Edwards. Zeke Baker is leaving me high and dry tonight. He is with his kids, but together we make the dads drink a bourbon wherever you are, whatever time it is. Thank you for making us part of your day is a special episode. Normally, Zeke and I would banter for a little bit, give each other a lot of hell. Thankfully, I get a break from that tonight because we have Brian Pruitt, who is the master distiller at A. Smith Bowman out of Virginia. Some of you may know this distillery because their cast strength was the favorite of many of people last year. Their cast strength bourbon made the number one on a lot of people's lists. It was a damn good pour. Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me on. I feel like this is a great opportunity because I was just about to tell you as we were chatting kind of in the pregame that I feel the cast strength put Bowman on a lot of people's radars that might not have heard of it before. And this is going to be a fun conversation because there's a whole hell of a lot of stuff that you guys are doing there that people don't even know. And I'm excited for you to tell them. Yeah, it's funny because I, I will. I think I definitely agree with you. You know, we've been quietly doing this for a long time. 85 years plus that we've been running as a distillery people just don't seem to remember that we're out there and then occasionally we'll we'll put one of these things out and, and people will show up and they'll go wow that was really great and then they just kind of seem to let it go to the wayside till the next one comes but i will say uh, on our latest abraham release after that cast rank the the line definitely started very quickly <laughs> i think people people knew we were there I'm lucky enough, you know, Prav Sarav did a few great Bowman picks out of D.C. at One West DuPont Wines. So I knew about it from that. All those boys in Virginia, D.C., they love Bowman. They can't talk about it enough. And then I think once you get into Kentucky and Tennessee, you know, it is a Sazerac brand. So I think a lot of people get confused on the relationship between Sazerac and Bowman. And then they're, they're kind of like, well, you know, we're just looking for Pappy and Blanton's. Where meanwhile, there's this distillery in Virginia that's quietly putting out, you know, some great products that you shouldn't overlook. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it, it's interesting you, know, you named uh, Prob there because Prob, I think he every chance he gets, he sends me uh, texts. He's like, when, I, when am I coming out and get to choose another barrel? When am I coming out? When am I coming out? Like, I think he's got me on like a timer, like every every month if I don't answer him. He's, he's sending me texts, man. And, uh, he texted me tonight too, so it's okay. We have a, a group. <laughs> we have a small group that we do uh, some picks and we're just, mostly we just rag on each other all day. This small, Facebook Messenger group, but we're always looking for a good pick, and and I know uh, between the dads and Prov, people are always looking for one of us to hook up a barrel. So I think maybe Prov and the dads need to get out there together and pick one, and then I'll just text you every day. There we go. There we go. <laughs> 
but getting to your to your other question, you know, yeah, you're you're right. A lot of people don't kind of know they know there's this connection of A. Smith Bowman and Sazerac, and and I think one of the things to it's it's interesting. So a lot of people you, you talk about Sazerac, it's you know it's one of the largest distillers in North America. We make ton of bourbon as a company and buffalo trace was the first acquisition of of sazerac you know out of new orleans they decided they wanted to get on the map purchased what was the ancient age turned it into buffalo trace and then you know what a couple of years later so the the relationship between ancient age and and um, and bowman was you know back in the 80s uh, east smith bowman started in reston in the 30s and, you know, we basically the city grew around. If you ever been to the Washington, D.C. area, been out there and that kind of that side of Washington, D.C., it's just a huge metropolis. And it basically grew around where the distillery was. So we had to kind of get out of the big city area. And we contracted with what was Buffalo Trace at the time to start making our recipe for us and do the first distillations while we were in the midst of the move. You know, we knew it was going to be a two to three year process, you know, come over, get everything set up. We overstocked our warehouses and then started moving all of our, you know, all of our stills, all of our barrels, all that. And uh, A. Smith Bowman was just so happened, you know, Sazerac came in, saw the relationship between the two, and it's like, and that was the number two distillery that they kind of picked up. And a lot of people didn't, you know, realize, you know, hey, here was, you know, you look at all the brands that are under a Sazerac umbrella, you know, it was really Buffalo Trace and then A. Smith Bowman were the, the, were the kind of the first two real acquisitions that they had, you know, once they started getting into the bourbon. And that was in, you know, 99. And then 2003 was when A. Smith Bowman came on. And then you had the Barton brands and, and some of the other ones, 1792 and uh, some of the other Montreal things like that cognac and at first I mean it was a Smith Bowman purchased it was a 7200 acre farm where this whole thing yeah. kind of started so to have 7200 acres and then have a city kind of get built up around it were they just selling off bits of the farm to help build the city or? yeah so they they basically sold off about seven seven thousand plus acres to Robert E Simon or, or basically a, a group and that's where the town of or the city of Reston came about. They sold the whole thing off. There was only a couple hundred acres. Eventually, I mean, people didn't necessarily love the fact that there was still a working cattle farm in the, in the town. There were we were bringing in cattle up the street to eat the slop every night. And you know, I think people were like, "What the heck's going on? You know, why is this distillery right in the middle of the skyscrapers type of thing?" But eventually, yeah, it was it was like, okay, maybe this isn't the best spot for a distillery. <laughs> Loved it up there. I think it was a be- you know beautiful area. There was you know it was obviously there was a lot of history there and our old distillery building, the cooling ponds, all that stuff is a lot of that stuff is still there, but we just decided to move to Fredericksburg in in the eighties and we've been there, you know, ever since. So since 88. Is that something that would be on like one of the historic register places where they may not ever tear it down? Yeah. So the, the actual original building, the original distillery building and the family building uh, are on the national historic register. And then actually the building that we're in now, is on the National Historic Register as well. And it was actually a cellophane and rayon plant. So it was this huge industrial complex. And I mean, everything there is, you know, built with three foot thick concrete and steel. And, and I mean, built in the 20s. And it was perfect for a distillery. And uh, yeah, we took it, uh, it had been abandoned in the 70s and we refurbished it. And we've been there ever since. And right now, we're, I think we've got what, four or five, we got five barrel warehouses going. It's been great. We love it. You know, the move happened, Sazerac acquired y'all, but tell me a little bit about your story. Were you a part of the deal when they acquired? Had you already been there? No, no. So I, I actually have been, I've been with A. Smith Bowman for about nine years. I've been in the alcoholic beverage industry for about 25 and about 20 of that in distilling. Uh, you know, got my degree in, in food science from Colorado State, went into the brewing industry because that was, you know, beer was beer really big in the in the 90s there and, and worked for a lot of breweries around Colorado. And uh, then, you know, decided I wanted to get a little more into, you know, kind of the education of beer, went to UC Davis in California, did the master brewers program there and came back and worked for a few more breweries in Colorado and around California. Then I think I got the bug, right? I wanted to learn what beer became when it grew up 
was fun dealing with all that beer, but I really was like, Hey, I want to take this to the next step. So that's when I kind of, yeah, I, I started looking around and at the time I was like, Hey, you know, there's a lot of opportunities actually in California. So I, I actually went to California and got into the wine industry of all places. I started in the wine industry and then started basically in the, in the brandy and distillation side uh, for a very large distillery on the West Coast. Worked there for a little over a decade and kind of took over the overall process operations there. And, and it was, you know, I started in craft and then I went to this huge, massive operation that we could, you know, we could feed a million gallons a day, just making tons and tons of alcohol. And uh, then I was like, hey, you know, I would love to get back onto that, the craft side, that, you know, the, the premium side. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So that's when brought me to, you know, I worked with Sazerac on bottling some of the products that I used to make. And I heard about the position that it opened up. Obviously, the previous master distiller had passed away unexpectedly. And uh, I was like, hey, this would be great. I think it'd be fun. And uh, that's what brought me out here. I told my wife, I said, uh, guess what? I just applied for a job in Virginia and, and Fredericksburg. And she, she looked to me we were living in northern california at the time and she's like where and uh yeah so uh, here we are <laughs> it's kind of tough going from like marin county to virginia it's a pretty big culture shock it was quite the culture shock yes absolutely <laughs> going you know hauling hauling all of our kids and all of our dogs and all you know cats and all that across the country and and winding up where it's like hey, it's sticky and humidity and it, all of a sudden it snows and my wife she's she's from california she doesn't know what's this white stuff <laughs> you know <laughs> so uh we had a farm you know we had we had all the you know, goats and chickens and horses and all that good stuff and i was like yeah had to get rid of uh, all the animals and then pack up and go have you talked to grant mccracken yet have you two hit it off over at chattanooga whiskey i haven't i haven't had a chance to talk to him you should reach out to him because he went from boston beer company to chattanooga whiskey so he kind of did the same thing he didn't have the wine stop in between but before he became the distiller down there he was doing beer too and i find it interesting do you find yourself i know there's a lot of different products at a smith bowman but do you find yourself experimenting thing with high malts and things like that absolutely yeah so i mean that's you know the experimentation obviously a lot of people know us for our experimentation and like the abrahams right different finishes different different mash bills things like that but you know, one of the things and we even have them you know sitting out when you come to the distillery and you'll see a rack and i, I used to call it my spice rack i would keep all my kind of rare different barrels that, that i would pull for you know different blends up there but um you know we put we put a couple of malt whiskeys up there there not too long ago just to show people like yeah it's not just bourbon that we're messing around with and yeah i had plenty of plenty of times like you know we did we worked with a couple of breweries and did some i'll call beer whiskeys and we've done some malt whiskeys and you know peated non-peated all sorts of different things that we have out there and i think you know most of them are a ways off but i'm excited to see what they can do uh, where they can end up because I, I really think in terms of a category, I know, I know bourbon is, is obviously a huge category, but I think the American whiskey, just overall American malt whiskey category is going to be a big category coming up. And it's got some interesting things that, you know, obviously pulls at a lot of my heartstrings from my beer background. And I think there's, there's enough room for, for bourbon and, and malt whiskeys out there. Well, and I even think that you're seeing a lot more bourbon whiskeys with a higher barley content and a, you know, just more malt in general because it goes down a little bit easy, brings out some of those really good chocolate notes, especially that. Yeah. Chocolate and you get some nutty notes. You can pick up some coconut. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think there's a lot of things there that, you know, I think for a long time, if you went with just a traditional, you know, bourbon mash bill, uh, you just haven't really been, you know, maybe experimenting with and, and seen. And I think that's one of the great things that's happening over the last, even the last five years. It's just, you know, a lot of people starting to use, you know, heritage grains and both and not only on the barley side, but, you know, on the rise, on the corns, um, you know, trying different wheats and, you know, different grains in the overall, you know, recipes for bourbons to, to really push, you know, with those flavor profiles and make something that's available for a lot of people. I mean, that makes my job interesting, you know, because a lot of the things, you know, uh, unfortunately, in my profession, yeah, I, I don't. I have a lot of stuff that I, I started nine years ago at, uh, at A. Smith Bowman and 
And I still, you know, yes, some of my products are already out there in the, in the I'll call it, you know, some of Bowman Brothers and Isaac is out there on the market. But, you know, the John Jays are, are just just about to hit some of the stuff that I started when I, you know, started making when I came on. I guess it just takes a long time before, you know, you have to wait a long time before you see the results of an experiment. It can be, you know, a decade or more. And that's a tough thing just in whiskey altogether. It's like you have a really good idea and you lay it down, you taste the new make, and then you just got to cross your fingers. You you know, you're tasting it every once in a while, but it's not going to be something. It's not for an anxious person. You have to have patience. Oh, and and then the worst part is, is that you have that patience and then maybe you forget about it a little bit. You're like, ah, I'll get back to it. You're like, hey, I haven't haven't tasted that in like a year. I should go check it out. And you taste it and you're like, yeah, this is awesome. This is great. Why did I forget about it? And then you go get the barrel and there's like two gallons left in it. And you're like, oh, <laughs> son of a gun. I love when you go on a barrel pick and you taste something and it's really, really good. And then you shake the barrel and they're like, yeah, this one's a shorty. You're like, ah, oh. <laughs> the light one. <laughs> you like that one it's gonna be a cheap one though it'll be cheap but like you know maybe you'll get 50 which is great if you're a podcast that's great we could move 50 bottles but if you're a store you're kind of like i get one pick and this is what i'm gonna do oh man (laughs) i wanted 250 350 bottles and i get 25 it's okay prof would text you the next day yes he would (laughs) I'll, i'll go ahead and take two what about, I mean, because you've distilled different things. What was your favorite thing to distill? I mean, I know, loaded question, you're probably going to say whiskey, but what was your favorite thing to actually do? And Well, I, I mean, you know, I've had opportunities to make bourbon, malt whiskeys, gins, rums. Uh, I spent time in Mexico making tequila, cognacs in France, Spanish brandies. I mean, you name it. I've, I've, I've had a chance to work on a lot of things around the world. And, um, and I, I really do love them all. And I think they have different nuances. Bourbon is just one of those things that's always fun to do. It's just, but it's also the kind of the thing that is, I'm always doing. So it's maybe not, you know, it's like, it's almost every day. Oh, bourbon's running. Okay. So then sometimes it's fun where you're like, oh, hey, we're making, we're making a rum today. Or, hey, we're making a malt whiskey today. Or gin's on the still today. And, you know, these are kind of fun. So I, I think they have all they they have all different nuances, and, I, and what I really love is actually taking methods that I would use, say, on a brandy, and trying them on a whiskey or trying them on a bourbon. You know, some traditional methods that you maybe wouldn't have used, and seeing how we can kind of melt and and create a better flavor profile. And that that's what I really love. I think, irregardless of the the source. I think they're really they're really fun. There's all sorts of things, you know. Obviously, in the summer, I love I love drinking my uh, vitamin G and vitamin T um, <laughs> uh, on a hot day. But uh, but in the winter, and it starts to cool down, that I've I got plenty of rum and, and bourbon around me, and of course, rum bourbons all the time. So that's my everyday drink. So it is. It is they're all good. I can't. You know, it's, it's like choosing between your kids, man. You can't. You can't do that. I totally get it. I, that's why I only have one kid. <laughs> Choosing between my dogs, though, that's another story. That's tough. I do have to ask, so you have distilled all these things. Is it easy to say, because I was having this conversation actually at work today, because I work in technology, and everybody wants to say that their case is unique. But when you distill it down to the essence of the process, the process is X, Y, Z for everyone. And they might call it something different. The how might be a little different, but the what is essentially the same. Is it the same for spirits or you know, when you're going to, to make it? There's a lot of the similarities, right? There's, you know, when the overall flavor aromas might be different, like when you're hitting heads on a bourbon versus when you, you know, what the heads smell like in a malt whiskey, they're completely different. They have a similarity, right? There's, you can kind of figure out, okay, this is, this is the heads, this is the hearts, you know, um, certain things are going to fall along the same lines. And so, yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty similar, but it's just little nuances, you know, it's, it's the trade difference that you have in, in your industry that make a big difference that can make a big you know difference in the overall flavor mouthfeel you know uh, aromas things like that and 
but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, what are you doing? You, you're, you're making alcohol from a starch or sugar. You're putting it into, you know, it's, it's fermenting. You're taking that fermentation. And, and if you use good, clean fermentations and not some dirty, nasty funkiness, you're probably going to end up with a, a good chance of making something pretty clean off the still. And then you have to treat it right on the back end if you're going to age it, right? If you do the aging right, the aging is going to, you know, whether you're aging bourbon, whiskey, rum, gin, whatever, it's going to age in a similar profile. The same way it's amount of contact, the amount of heat that you're putting at it, the amount of air that's flowing, you know, the proof that it is in the barrel, they're all going to kind of, it's all going to be about the same. You put your spirit type here and, and go to the next one. <laughs> We've talked about this actually recently on a podcast that I don't really need to go on tours of distilleries anymore. It's like, I, I know what a still looks like. I know what a fermenter looks like. And you know, when we're going to do a barrel pick, we said half the time we skip the tour, but the things I look at now five years into this podcast than I would have before really comes down to like, what's the automation level at Bowman? Is it something where, cause you talk about the smell of the heads and the hearts and is it automated where you're really going off a computer now, or is there some of that feel there too? No, no, it's all analog. <laughs> it's all analog. I, we, we, you know, I work with distilleries that, yeah, you can pull up, you know, the still on your phone and, and do whatever you want. You're like, Hey, I'm in, I'm on the beach and I can do my cuts. And no, it's not, not, uh, not at ASB. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're completely analog. So the, the best uh, PLC that we have is on our bottling line. And that's like basically just opens a gate and closes and brings down a piston and that's about it everything else is you know all of our cuts we're all done by hand uh you know we're sitting there on the still we're smelling them we're we're checking the proof we're checking temperatures we're checking pressures and yeah that's that's how we're running our still and it's yeah me coming in there and working with you know the the guy that's been running our still jimmy he's been running our still for 34 years right he's been running mary so we name all of our stills because that's just that's just what we do right you got it right yeah, well, we have we have Mary, and she's our two thousand gallon copper pot still. She makes all of our bourbons and whiskeys. We have George, and George is our experimental still, and he makes everything. So he's a hybrid pot still, right? So he, he'll do uh, whiskeys, he can do gin, he can do you know vodka. We we're making gin on on George today, and then we have Abe. Abe is our uh, pilot still, so all named after the Bowman family. A lot of people think that it's you know being where we're at. They're like, oh, that's Mary and George Washington. No, it's Bowman family, you know, Jimmy has been running that still for 34 years. And just like, you know, I'll come in and I'll smell the air and I can, you know, I'm like, okay, you're about ready to run heads. And I can hear the the way that the steam is hitting the still. And we actually say Mary starts singing. So you can start hearing this little hum and, and it's like the vibrations of the metal or such. And you're like, okay, it's about ready to start coming over. I can smell it in the air. And then you know exactly how long it's going to take, right? It's okay. This is, it, it's going to take this much time. And then you're, you're like, oh, it's time. It's time for the, for the heads cut. And then we'll go through there and you'll come back in a little bit later and you're running hearts. And, and then maybe at the end of the day, you know, if you're at the end of a run, you'll be like, wait, wait, it sounds different. It smells different. We're, we're on tails. Let's, let's check this out. Like I said, we're tasting it, you know, every 15 minutes we're, we're checking to make sure everything's right. And yeah, that's what they do. So I guess it's uh, old school automation is the way that we do it. And we just have somebody standing at the still, the still man. But there is something attractive for that, I think, knowing where you came from and knowing that you came from that big high production plant and oh, yeah. getting back and like getting to roll your sleeves up. You know, it's the whole master distiller conversation where a lot of times it's the plant manager and they get called master distiller because you got to call them master distiller. There's got to be something fun and kind of coming in there going, all right, I, I think it's time to cut. Yeah. No, it's absolutely fun. I mean, and I think that's, and that's where, you know, like some of the guys that have only been there for a few years, I'll be in there and I'm like, do you smell that? Do you hear that? And they're like, what, what? And it just sounds like a pump. I'm like, no, 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 no. Look, that, that sound changed. Do you hear how it changed? And you hear, do you smell that, you know, in the air? And the, it, yeah, I think so. 
no, do you smell it? Let's go, let's go over there and check it. It's time to check on the still. And uh, yeah. And I think that is, I mean, that's obviously part of the art that it takes a long time to learn and don't get me wrong. I mean, there's beautiful parts about being able to go, okay, I want to hit this proof, set that flow rate. Okay. Put it in auto. All right. I'm good. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, that's wonderful when you're tired and it's 2 AM and you want to get the hell out of there. I think it's, it's also great to have the ability to, as long as you can keep your flavors and your profiles consistent with the manual and the analog operations, that's the key, right? And that's the art part of it and science part, you know, obviously meshing the two and making sure that you're getting that consistency and quality. You know, that's the great thing about automation is that you're always consistent, but if you're consistently bad, then what good does it do you? The funny thing about it too is you know, you're consistent, but those barrels, once you put the, the whiskey in the barrel, all bets are off. So you work oh, yeah. so hard to make sure that there is this consistency, but there is this X factor and the barrel is just over there laughing. It's like, well, depending on where you put me in the rick, depending on what floor you put me on, depending on if I'm by a window, whatever it is, like if I'm in the center. Depending on if the tree grew on a north facing face or a south facing or it had rocky soil or low be soil yeah it's it just throws you all off but i guess that's the beauty of the single barrel right have you found the sweet spots at asb yet like uh, do you know where the honey holes are this is the great part about asb if you if you come to asb you're gonna you're gonna notice our warehouses are not they're they're not we're not we don't stack as high we only stack about 15 so we stack anywhere from four to six high but we're really consistent in temperature and overall gradient and like Temperature, humidity, airflow across front to back, left to right, top to bottom. Basically, it's one big sweet spot. So I can pretty much pick anywhere I want. Now, if there there are spots, though, that I'll say, okay, I want this to age faster. Okay, I'm going to put it up high in this corner because we have one warehouse that gets sun all day long, right? And it, it just has these huge skylights and the sun just beams on it all day long. It just gives that little extra bit, right? That little extra bit of thermal heat and a little bit of energy going into that barrel and it'll just pick it up just a little bit more than say the barrel that's down at the bottom of the rack. Or conversely, something like we just released a 15-year-old and I, I, I wanted to make sure it would make it 15 years. Yeah, I put that in the deepest, darkest corner that I could find uh, that is solid concrete on basically all sides. So that just kind of stayed. It was like, I tasted it at 10 years and I'm like, okay, let's see if we can get this to take 15, put it in the corner. And yeah, and it did not much left in it, but it was good. <laughs> it was one of those ones you shook it. And you're like, well, a little light. Yeah. Well, we had one of those. Yeah. We actually had one that we did uh, just, just recently and it was 15 years old. I was hoping to do it as an experiment, but I picked it up. And when you go to roll a barrel and you can pretty much pick it up. And you're like, oh, well, okay. That's like four cases. I'm not going to release that one. <laughs> no, that's just going to the workers. <laughs> <laughs> You talked about how it's a plant that y'all took over and that you have five places to age, five warehouses. Are those warehouses in concrete or are they in wood? How's that kind of work on your property? So all of our, all of our warehouses, what we do have one that is a steel sided warehouse. That's basically our, our distillery is, is just steel, like our main just where our stills are, but all of our, other barrel warehouses are basically concrete, brick, concrete ceilings. Uh, and then we'll have, depending on the warehouse, three of them have varying, you know, levels of windows. These old, old factories that have, you know, a lot of the little square windows everywhere. And then we have one that is just solid concrete and brick. The great part is, is that they are, they do vary from warehouse to warehouse, but they vary, I mean, just a minimal amount. So it, it, which is, it's been great. So we've had great whiskeys come out of every single warehouse that we've, you know, we've got on the property and, uh, you know, it's not like we have a warehouse where like, ah, I wish we didn't have to put it in this spot. It's like, yeah, we've had award-winning whiskey coming out of this row and we've had award-winning whiskey coming out of that one. They're different, but they just produce slightly different variances. And sometimes what we'll do is that, yeah, I'll, I'll view it and You know, I I think, hey, it's not getting the right thing. So I will move it to a different warehouse that will potentially, you know, give it a different flavor profile. And I'm not against moving it, you know, two or three times if I have to. I mean, it's all about making the best product that I can. 
I think it's common knowledge for people that follow kind of MGP that because of their concrete warehouses, the proof goes down. Is that something that happens to y'all too? Like if you leave it in there eight, 12 years, is the proof going down? No, no, no. We, we are exactly the opposite. So we're, we're right. It's a really interesting area. So we're right on the tidewater, right on the edge of the tidewater of the Piedmont area. So basically we're right on the Rappahannock river. And I mean, that connects to the Chesapeake. So it gets full tide. It gets the tide every day. And we're basically right on that river. So the humidity levels are a little bit different. The, you know, it's a little bit cooler air mixing with that, you know, kind of the Piedmont air coming down from the Appalachians. And it's kind of an interesting area. And you would think that being in those concrete warehouses with the extra humidity that we would lose, you know, lose proof, which would be typical in a lot of those areas, but we actually, we gain a lot of proof. Uh, I mean, I actually dumped a barrel the other day. The one that I was just telling those like light, it was 162 proof. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> and you saw the cast strength, that's 141. We, you know, typical for us at 10 years is in the one forties, which I don't think there's, there's not many distilleries out there that I think typically would hit that kind of proof at that age. No, it's funny you say that because I, I knew the answer before I asked the question, but it's, uh, I think the first Bowman I ever had was one that Zeke got and it was some crazy high proof. It was like the highest proof you could get while still being called a bourbon. It was like 159 something. It's like, you got to try this stuff. It was awesome. I mean, I swear, I think we had it in like 2017 or 2018. It was a while ago. So I knew, you know, and then with all props picks, I kind of knew your proof went up, but I find that incredibly interesting compared to other concrete warehouses that are very common that people know about where it is the opposite effect. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of them you'll find, you know, hey, nine, 10 years, you'll find it. It's in the, you know, they, they put it in at 125 and then all of a sudden it's at, you know, 117, 108, you know, some, somewhere in that range, but just don't get me wrong. I love, that's a great proof for putting it in the barrel, but I love seeing it going up i just think the flavor profile comes you know through our the flavor profile that we get at asb let me put it that way is really a tribute to that you know those higher proofs but you're getting some great flavors at those lower proofs too so i would love to be able to manipulate one of my warehouses that i could have it so that i could choose that you know just have hey i want this warehouse i want to be able to say i want it to go down and proof on this you know maybe start high and then go low i don't know that's something to experiment with i guess i mean i was gonna ask you about experimentation especially off that because you know it's very famous that buffalo trace has their experimentation warehouse where they're doing temperature controlled stuff they're doing the single oak project they're doing all sorts of other things how much of that trickles down to what you're doing in that kind of spirit of that sazerac experimentation because we know y'all are doing it so sazerac part of the part of the thing that is really the ceo is is really been you know put out for all of sazerac is experimentation and that's you know for us it really has been a core at Attribute of what a smith bowman is and, and i would think one of the things that we kind of do it's it's basically uh, you know for years and years it's it's been you know here's here's the things i'll call them the mainstream stuff that the buffalo trace will go out and go yeah yeah we'll do that and then they'll go that's really effing crazy no way we're not going to touch that i'll do it what the <laughs> hell <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've had some crazy things in the past that have been serious failures but you know whatever we're we're that's we're learning stuff um what's one thing that was a failure can you tell oh yeah well we uh, we keep one on the rack for people it's it, i think it's like 19 years old now and it's the worst whiskey i've ever tasted in my life uh it is a um hot sauce whiskey <laughs> uh so it was it, it, it was a bourbon that was finished in a hot sauce barrel it didn't get rinsed. It's like you pull it out and it's got ropey nastiness, little chili flakes coming in. It. It's, <laughs> it's, it's so, so bad. But we keep it there to remind ourselves, never, ever, ever do another hot sauce whiskey. <laughs> I love this kind of stuff. I did a thing for the Tennessee Guild and it was all just internal webinars, but I had moderated it for them. Whenever anybody did a presentation at the end of it, we said, okay, tell us a time where whatever topic you're talking about. So one person was talking about stills and distilling. Uh, another couple of distilleries were talking about barrels and you know, so on and so forth. And then at the end of it, we're like, tell us a time you messed up. And it's oh, some yeah. of my favorite conversations in whiskey because there's so many things 
you don't know oh yeah pulling a barrel in the winter opposed to pulling a barrel in the summer can completely change everything like you could have a happy accident there was one distiller that had a leaker in the winter and that's what told him that he needed to start pulling those barrels in the winter because he wouldn't have known unless it was a terrible leaker we have had some awful awful failures and uh we learn a lot more from those failures than I think we do from the successes. We've tried to do crazy starting stuff that, you know, when we calculate it out, we calculate the raw cost of certain types of ingredients. And, uh, you know, we calculate it out and it's like, well, that's going to cost us about $50,000 a barrel to make. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're not going to do that one, you know, and, and things that you taste and you're just like, yeah, that's not even going to work. It's not even worth coming off the still. We're we're just going to go ahead and dump it now. There's been some doozies out there, and I've got you know I've got like 500 experiments going at any given time. So you know I've got a lot of things going, and you know some things uh, you know I've been I was on a failure streak in January. And now just just last week I had a great success. On, I've been working on fermentations, so a lot of the experiment that I've been doing. You know, a lot of people would talk about, yeah, bur- the barrel or they'll talk about, you know, how they distilled it. But I've been working really actively on the overall flavor profile of fermentation and, you know, put in a brand new system, state of the art system to, to really manipulate fermentation profiles. I couldn't even get some of this stuff to ferment the way that I was trying to push it for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then finally, I just I was like, all right, this is what I'm going to do just finished it up last week and i was like oh five tries you know when you're when you're sitting there and you're dumping a fermenter because you're not even going to bother distilling it you're like no i'm not even bother on that one finally got it so you know it's there's a there's a lot of a lot of experimentation going on there it's what keeps me uh, keeps me enjoying going in every day i think you have to right because if it was just all right yeah i know when to start sniffing or i know when a sound is going to change and it's the same thing every day you might as well just stay at the big old wine factory making brandy and you're getting to work the still on your phone yeah i mean it's and that's that's not exciting at all to me i mean i'd I'd rather you know i want to be there and 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 get my hands dirty and you know i was doing that today and when you walk away and your shoes are you know they're supposed to be waterproof but you you end up with wet shoes and and socks every day because you're off in the cellar dragging hoses around and running the still and you know trying to get everything running that's it's definitely fun now talk to me a little bit about you were talking about making all the stuff but there are a lot of different skews and it's all a different brother so there's the regular bowman brothers which comes in at 20 $29.99. $29.99. There's the Isaac Bowman that is a port barrel finish. Mm-hmm. The John J. Bowman, which is the single barrel. So there's George the Tarum, Deep Run, and Sunset Hills. What are they? So Sunset Hills is a gin. So more of a traditional London dry style gin. Deep Run is a uh, 100% corn vodka. Distill, we distill it seven times. We also have a full line of Obviously, we have the cast drink, which is a, a, a full release, which is a 10-year-old bourbon. And then we have a uh, also a line of gins called Tinkerman's. So that we have a line of uh, three different gins. So Citrus Supreme, Bright and Complex, and uh, Sweet Spice. Nice. What is the difference in the aging of the regular Bowman Brothers, the John Jay? So the, the, the interesting thing is a lot of people think that they're different recipes. They're all our Bowman recipe. So we, we have our Bowman recipe, our, our standard recipe, which is corn, rye, and malt. And basically, for Bowman Brothers, it's it's a small batch, you know, and that's and it's one of those contentious things in the industry, obviously, because people are like, well, what the hell does small batch mean? And but but for us, a small batch is you know it's about so it's no more than a thousand gallons because we have thousand gallon tanks and it's about twenty barrels, and you know we used to have five hundred gallon tanks, so that was small batch for us, but now we have. In thousand gallons, which is in terms of the larger distillers, you know, that's you know not even a, a fifth of one of their normal size tanks. So you know that's for us, like I said, a small batch, triple distilled, and typically aged anywhere from six to seven years, sometimes longer. It's a blend of barrels. So then the Isaac, the difference between the Isaac is basically the same Bowman recipe and we followed along in 2016 we took a world's best bourbon for a port finish uh, so what we did is we kind of followed that same method that we did for that port finish and developed that the isaac bowman and we take uh, ruby port barrels from portugal 
And we also mix in a lot of um, different port barrels from around Virginia, differing oaks. Most of it is American oak, but there is some French oak. There is some other, you know, I'll call them mixed woods in there. Basically age in a port barrel for anywhere for three to six months. And then we blend all those together into one big gigantic oak tank, a fooder. So it's a 6,200 gallon, basically oak barrel. And we've never, it's a Solera process on that. So we've never actually emptied that since we started making that bourbon in 2017. We've never emptied that tank. We never take it more than halfway empty. And then we dump the next blend on. And so it's always mixing, always aging. It's a really cool chocolate note from that tank. So that's that's the Isaac. Is it fun to just pour right from the Solera barrel sometimes? Because Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, It's, you walk up and you're like, ooh. There's a little tap there and everything. Every time I go to a distillery that has a Solera barrel, I'm like, please, please, can I just get one sip? They're always just, if you get it right from there, it, it's still good when it's in the bottle. Don't get me wrong, but it, there's something about, it's like having Guinness in Dublin opposed to when it comes back to the, the US, you know? Agreed. Agreed. It's, it is quite, it's quite exotic when you get to pull it from the tank. It's a, uh, it's definitely a fun treat. But then, yeah, and then the John Jay, um, hopefully you have a, you have a sample of that around somewhere, but our John Jay right, is- uh, Right here, I've been sipping on it while we've been talking. Wonderful. <laughs> it is a same recipe. Uh, we go anywhere from a nine to 10 year. We average closer to 10 year. And we don't, we don't put ages on our products because it's not about the age. We don't want to say, hey, this is 10 and a half years, or this is 11 years, because- it's, it's more about the flavor profile, right? We want to hit the flavor profile. And if it takes nine years to get that flavor profile, great. I mean, that's that's great for us. But we've released in the past, we've had 14-year-old John Jays out there. That's how long it took to hit the flavor profile. So that's that's what we you know put out there as the John Jay. 100 proof. And obviously, you know, it's basically the, the pure essence of what you're getting single barrel. So every single barrel is going to be slightly different. We use uh, an American oak. Typically, we have a little more of a custom char. It's kind of close to a number four char. It gives a really nice flavor profile for us. And then there's the cast strength. So that's the, <laughs> that's the Abram. So there's, there's all the brothers there, right? So there's the, you know, got to, got to go through all the brothers. Abram is the minimum of 10 years at barrel proof and then we don't uh we don't do a chill filter or anything on it so we just it's just how it came out of the barrel everybody wants to know so you know when i put up on instagram what questions do you have for asb everybody came back with i must have got 10 responses saying and that's not many because i only had it up for a couple hours but i did have many um responses that basically said any more hazmat releases in the future and when are we going to have more cast strength so those are is that going to be an annual thing is it really yeah, if so it's, it's it's annual it's and we're targeting we're going to try and target at the beginning of the year every year so somewhere you know kind of in the first half of the year and then eventually you know we we're, we're trying to basically for the first few years trying to just double every single release that we do and eventually you know we may have to do more than one release a year but that's the goal right now so we're getting pretty close let me put it that way that in the next few months we're, we're hoping to have another another cast strength uh, coming out and it's going to be yeah, a regular thing i'm pretty sure i mean i've been cherry picking some pretty good barrels out there they're not low, let me put it that way. So <laughs> I can't guarantee that it's going to be, you know, high as Matt, but um, I, I'm going to say that it's there's a high likelihood that it will be 140 proof just because of, you know, what we were talking about. It's our typical range at 10 years. We're getting up in the 140s easy. Yeah, those are, those are coming. And then obviously, you know, we had that Abraham that we just released not too long ago. And that was, that was, uh, if, if we would have done that one, that would be that would have been a hazmat, but uh, there was just at 15 years it was just way too little of that to, to, to do a hazmat. But um, but we owe we owe people some Abrahams. We know COVID kind of slowed us down a little bit, so we have a lot on our docket this year. I mean, I have we haven't released a lot of Abrahams in a row. I think I'd like to get you know three at least three Abrahams out this year and, and, a, and a cast strength and then even some experimental series, which are non whiskeys. So, you know, whatever those may be. 
So it's going to be an exciting year for us. So those those of you who who follow us on uh, all the pages should be able to at least be entertained with the different releases, whether or not we you know we're hoping that you can get them, but you know we know that some of them turn out to be unicorns, unfortunately. I will tell you, I know you come through my area. Zeke and I very famously don't beg distilleries for bottles. We say, hey, we're fine with two ounces each. Just when you come through, if you happen to have a little Boston round, I'll, I'm, I'll trade you something we got and uh, we'll go through some of these together. Perfect. I'm, I'm there. This John Jay, I have to say, we talked about it in our last episode. I had a cold this week, and so I'm struggling a little bit with my palate. What I will say is even with my cold, this John Jay, the nose is the only way I can describe this nose for you is Rick House. Like it is so just thick, like I'm sitting in a Rick House. I know that I could sit there and give like tasting notes on that, but that's the crazy thing for me when I opened it up and put it in my glass. And even as it's been sitting here, it is still a strong nose that comes up and it really just gives me that nice factory sense like I'm I'm there, I'm at a distillery, and it feels like home. Yeah, w- walking in the front door of Basement Bowman, that's what you get. Yeah. You get that nice, sweet, soft vanilla. It is. It's one of those things. It's vanilla and caramel. It it just really, it's it's a nice mouthfeel. It's not super spicy. It's got a little bit of spice to it. I mean, there's some a little bit of earthy spice to it, a little bit of that rye coming through. But it's it's really about the barrel. It's and and that's what I that's what I love about it. I'm I'm actually looking around for a bottle now. You're you're making me look for one of my bottles. I'm gonna have to do that. <laughs> you are, but that earthy spice. You got to get up early. I'm keeping you up late. You got to go to the distillery here in a couple hours. <laughs> but the earthy spice probably hits the back of my palate more than the the front. And I know you're not allowed to say mash bills. So I will be very careful about how I ask this question, but I I have to think that it's a low rye, just the way that it hits. You may or may not be correct, but I will say this. It's a higher rye than some, but it's not a mid-Atlantic rye. Let me put it that way. Yeah. I mean, it's not (laughs) because every time I've had a Bowman and even the cast strength, which anybody who drinks the cast strength that says this thing is not, there's some heat there, right? It's a good heat. But there's some heat there, but I never get that front of the mouth tingle like I would on a very heavy rye. You know, the it the the popping, almost that pop rock sensation, it always kind of hits further back in my palate with Bowman than it would from you know, something that you know, you're sitting there and you have thirty six percent rye and you're like, you know, the the your lips are tingling at the same time you have that coating and the heat going on. Yeah, well and, and it's it's funny because, you know, obviously being where we started our original recipe so we changed the, we changed our recipe probably in the mid 80s or early 80s uh, not necessarily mid 80s but early 80s and then we changed our yeast in probably like 83 was the last time that we changed our yeast which is it a really big deal big, right i mean well, that's huge yeah i still I and mean, i still have the yeast so we still have it cryogenically frozen uh you know i've got it i've got it actually have it on stored in in a yeast lab like that's not going anywhere. I, you know, I, I pay that monthly bill. I know where it's at. We're getting that yeast back whenever we need it. True story. One of our previous master distillers, and there's only been six of us. He was actually buried with a vial of that yeast in his pocket. You know, that's how important the yeast is to us, you know, as distillers. But anyway, we, we changed that in, in mid 80s or the early 80s. And the really part of it was because we really went from more of a mid Atlantic rye style of bourbon, you know, this really high 30, 40% rye content down to, I'll call it more of a traditional bourbon recipe. We needed to kind of mitigate that spiciness a little bit and try and get it a little bit sweeter. Y'all do a good job with it. We talked about all the experimentation you're doing. We talked about all the great whiskeys and gins and vodkas you have. I do have to ask, how does it feel knowing that Bowman is finally, I mean, it, it was on the map with the port finish, but I don't feel like the pop for the port finish was as as high as the cast strength. I mean, that's got to feel good, right? It it does. It feels, you know, when I came in, it was for a long time, A. Smith Bowman was just kind of plugging away as a regional distillery. 
And I don't think there was, you know, there had a, a great local following, but I think it's really, it's really gaining traction. And I think, you know, over the last, the, some of the things that we've been doing over the last, you know, five, six years of, of just really starting to pay dividends and, you know, putting out the kind of uh, products that we want to put out on a daily basis. You know, that's what we want to be known for. When we, when we talk about, when I talk about with my crew and we're running this still, you know, it's about making the best product we possibly can, putting out high quality all the time, not, you know, not letting anything get out. You know, we, we count the number of quality problems that we get complaints about on one hand in a year and we get one and we get pissed, right? We, we get pissed. We're like, and not at the person that complains about it. We're like, holy crap. All right, we'll fix it. We'll make it right. But then we're, we're, we're digging through our logs. We're finding out you know, what went wrong. How can we fix it? How can we improve it? And that's just our daily mantra. And, you know, and I think that's great to see, you know, paying those dividends and, and seeing people really respect and, and finally start to go, oh, yeah, they make pretty good stuff versus maybe some of the stuff that we were known for in the past, which was, you know, a lot of value brands. And they go, oh, that stuff. And it, it's great to think, oh, yeah, yeah, you guys, you guys make that, that one stuff, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, we do. I think it's good, though, because you do have a good mix the Bowman Brothers is a $30 bottle. We need more $30 drinkers. Everybody's putting out LTOs that are triple figures and, you know, bourbon yeah, is becoming yeah. more expensive. It's nice to have a brand that is still going to have quality, but, you know, even the the single, yes, it's a hundred proof, but the John Jay is still under 50. Yeah, absolutely. And that's always been, and that's been one of our targets too, is like surprise and delight, right? We want to, we want to delight our customers and put out great value. You're right. You know, we don't have to put out, yeah, we, you know, we could turn the corner and decide, you know, prices are way up. We, we should sell all of our stuff for $150 a bottle, but it, that doesn't, it's not going to do us any good. We want to put out a product every day that you can go and you don't feel bad. You know, it's not something that you have to, oh, I only want to touch this on a really special occasion. It's, it's, it's triple digit price. I don't want to, you know, that I'm not going to make a old fashioned with it. I, I'm only going to, I'm going to pull it straight. I'm, I'm, you know, special occasion. You know, we want something that people can go out and say, yeah, this is, this is what I want to have today. I want to have this nice bourbon. And oh yeah, it doesn't cost me an arm and a leg. It was 30 bucks. And it's been 30 bucks since I've been at the distillery. All of our prices, we haven't changed at all. For nine years, we have, we've never taken a price uh, on any of ours. So. And I appreciate that because I hate those reviews where I have to say, you know, this whiskey is really good. But I think it's about 20 bucks too high. You know, like I, I hate those reviews because then everybody. sting my heart too, by the way. You're seeing that, you're like, oh, man. But everybody gets mad at me because they're like, you're fixated on price. And I'm like, man, I'm a dad. Like, I, I got to pay for soccer. I got to pay for dance. I got to pay for now she wants to do acting classes. I mean, all this crap's expensive. Oh yeah, I hear you. I've got three. You, you know, I had to go to I had to go to zone defense. I'm not, you know, I wasn't in the man to man. Still, I'm in zone. One, you're still in zone. One is like a cover two zone, and then you got to go cover two man when you got two. But you're you're outnumbered with three. You're doing a zone, but you're just kind of hoping that the third one doesn't break out. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you get tangled up, then one's gone. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to see all the great stuff that's going to come out at ASB. I can't wait to see things going on in the future, all the, the success that you all have achieved this past year and, and the years before. I think pretty soon you're going to realize what the great philosopher, the notorious B.I.G. said, where you have more money, more problems, and you're going to have more profs blowing your phone up for pics every day and, and all that other good stuff. But it's a good problem to have. It is. It is. And, and we, we love, we love the fact that, you know, we, we have everybody coming out and trying to get our products and you know, our biggest problem right now is making sure that we get enough bourbon out there for everybody. That's, I mean, that's been the biggest issue. It's getting, getting bourbon out the door and uh, take it from somebody in the industry. We're trying, <laughs> we're trying. <laughs> it takes a long time. We, we haven't even gone through the whole, you know, is supply chain hitting y'all right now? Like it is oh, other people. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we, I mean, we had, we had a month and a half. We couldn't get glass and, and you're just sitting there and you're, 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 you know, I'd pull out my hair if I had it, but, um, you know, you, you're just, you're, you're calling all your, all your suppliers and you're like, I can't do anything if I don't get something to put it in. 
And I think so. your bottle shapes are very iconic. Have you, did you think about in that instance, like changing to get whatever bottle you could to put something out temporarily or? No, I think it's, it's always been, it's been our bottle for, for years and years. And we just don't, I mean, if we had to, if we, if we were going to, if they're going to come out and they're going to say, you're not going to get glass for six months, eight months, then I think it's going to be a pretty quick conversation and be like, all right, what can we get? Let's get this done. <laughs> but <laughs> Well, we're glad that you got it because those bottles, they are a very much a unique signature as well as the whiskey inside. Brian, you're going to have to come on again. We're going to have to hang out here in middle Tennessee, but thank you so much for coming on Dad's Drink and Bourbon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And the folks can go ahead and find us on Facebook at Dad's Drink and Bourbon, Twitter at Bourbon Dads, Instagram at Dad's Drink and Bourbon. Make sure to follow ASB on all of the socials, all that other stuff. That's A. Smith Bowman. And then you can find us here in Nashville, Tennessee. Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Thank you.